Reading with your kids. Hola, Niha, Kunichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Moni Moli Wanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show in the iHeartRadio app on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Danielle Clayton. She's here to celebrate her new novel, Shattered Midnight. It's part of the Mirror series. Before we invite Danielle into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Fit for Off Duty, a manual for firefighters, healing from work-related trauma, restoring personal relationships, and thriving at home by Dr. Peter Salerno. The health and well-being of our first responders that serve us is more important than ever, especially in light of the global health crisis. First responders are exposed to work-related trauma every time they are on duty. And this takes a serious toll on them personally, as well as on their spouses and children. It's so important to provide first responders with resources to help them thrive both professionally and at home. Dr. Peter Salerno, a licensed psychotherapist, in his book, Fit for Off-Duty, a manual for firefighters, provides a valuable resource for firefighters and their families. Dr. Salerno, who was raised in a firefighting family himself, covers the common signs of work-related trauma, exposure for firefighters, and discusses ways in which firefighters can heal from the stress of the job, as well as repair personal relationships with family members while off-duty. It's an invaluable resource for firefighters who may not know just how impacted they are by the work that they do. Please check out Dr. Peter Peter Salerno's Fit for Off-Duty, a manual for firefighters. It's available on Amazon and at other book retailers. For more information about Dr. Salerno, you can follow him on Instagram at Dr. Peter Salerno, as well as check out his professional website, drpetersalerno.com. Fit for Off Duty, a manual for firefighters. Get your copy today. And if you know a firefighter, it would be great to gift them with this very useful resource. Join us right now from New York City. Our guest today is here to celebrate Shattered Midnight. It is part of the Mirror Series, a great YA title from our guest, Danielle Clayton. Hey, Danielle, how are you? I'm good. How are you? So excited to be here. I'm excited to have you on. Danielle and I were both uh, sharing complaints about it being cold, and that we, yes. that we shouldn't have to deal with this <laughs> Like this winter weather. Done with this. It's freezing. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what we get for where we live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's lots of benefits living here in the Northeast. It's a fun part of the world. Uh, Shattered Midnight, this is this is really different. As I understand it, The Mirror is a, a four-book series, and each book is written by a different author. Am I right about that? You are correct. It's innovative and different in that we're sort of like the story Avengers. We have created a multiverse together um, and it's a big family. So in the first book, Broken Wish, you meet two families and something happens between them. There's a broken promise and that broken promise sets off a curse And that curse follows through all of the books. And so then you meet my character, who is the granddaughter of a character that you've met in the first book. And now we see how the curse has metastasized and now it's snowballed. And there's big trouble and mischief afoot. But yes, there are four of us writing in this universe. Now, we've had some authors, uh, we had some really fun uh, events here in the podcast. We've asked groups of authors, uh, I've given them a prompt, and author one takes the prompt and you know writes a few paragraphs and hands it off. There's no planning between, you, you get what you do, and then you take it where you want to go next. Is that, what, is, is that what's going on with the mirror, or is there an editor kind of going, no, Danielle, I want it to go in this direction over here? 
We have a story architect, okay. our editor, Brittany Rubiano, who's amazing from Disney. She had her eyes on all of the books, and we had all of these story meetings where we would discuss how the events of each book would ripple out because there are magical objects and there are magical things that you see in book one that take on a new transformation in book two, three, and four. So we had to plan all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was it really felt like being in like a TV writer's room where we're all in there talking it out, breaking story. And then also if I get backed into a corner, I can text or have a story meeting um, with all of them and they can help me fix it so that I don't make a mistake that will topple over something that needs to happen for books three and four. Mm -hmm. So it was a puzzle and Mm -hmm. it was a fun puzzle. Yeah. Was it different? Did you find yourself, uh, you know, restrained and that, oh, I can't write the way Danielle would normally write. I have to fit into this kind of of plan here. No, it was actually quite liberating because someone had already figured out the plot for me and I had to execute it because half of the time when you're a writer, figuring out the plot is the hard part. Um, so I got to bring my secret sauce to the book. Each book feels like it could live in our own particular canon, um, but then also they all speak to each other. So I got to do the things that I love to do. I just had to make certain story choices to make sure that Jen Cervantes, who's next with Fractured Path, her book, could continue on. I had to, I had to make a few little things happen so that the next book could work. Now, I understand that the, the character that you introduce is Zora. Can you tell us yes. a little bit about Zora? Yes. Zora is a young woman. She is from New York City, um, and she goes down to New Orleans. Her mother and father sent her down there to live with her aunt and her cousins because something magical has happened in New York that she's got to lay low from, and I won't spoil it. And so she's down there, and she's hiding. And while she's hiding and figuring out, like, oh, my gosh, I have magic. I have magic that I can't control. I have magic that I don't understand because the magic comes from her grandmother. And if you've read book one, you've met her grandmother. And she's trying to figure all of that out because her grandmother passed away before she could really teach her how to control her magic. And so while she's in New Orleans, she's getting like wrapped up in the jazz um, clubs and in the jazz music because she's also a musician and her magic is related to music. So she's obsessed with music. And what I love about Zora is that she has a great passion um, and she's found the thing that makes her so excited. Um, And it's something that I would, I want young people to be able to find the thing that makes you feel alive. And for Zora, that's music. She's also quite stubborn and quite sensitive, which I think are noble qualities um, because she's attuned to the world and wants connection, but she's also stubborn in her convictions and is not easily moved. So when she meets um, what will turn into a forbidden romance and the love of her life, it is a difficult start to the romance for Mm. all of the reasons of the time period, but also because she's so stubborn. Uh, uh, Are there any autobiographical features in, in Zora? Oh, absolutely. My mother would say I'm, I am stubborn, um, <laughs> stubborn and passionate. Instead of music, it's books for me. Also, my family is from that area. They're from Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana, that area of the world. And so I spent a lot of my childhood down there. So I really tried to mine a lot of my family experiences. My grandfather was born in 1931 and my great grandmother was living through this time period um, at the same time. And so, and I grew up with her around and talking to her her about it. And so I tried to pull a lot of that texture in the book um, and make it feel like both a product of its time, but have the, has that the texture of it. We also don't get to see new other cities besides New York and Chicago when we think of the 20s, mm-hmm. right? So going to New Orleans was an opportunity to um, showcase a different version. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we talk, uh, Americans have a bad rap that you, you you know, they always say you never leave the country. You know, over half the p- people in the United States don't have passports, and that's true. And I think folks should get out and experience different cultures. But I think one reason that we don't travel outside the country is that our country is so big and so diverse. And when you're talking about New York City and New Orleans and Mississippi, that's like traveling to a different country in some ways. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, just the cultures are so, they are so different. Um, and there are similarities. New mm-hmm. Orleans and New York, they are cities that, that you can disappear into that are thick and brimming over with culture and community. Um, and they're very odd, right? They're odd places. And I find New Orleans to be, I see something new every time I go. Um, and you're like, it's, it's also a melting pot for a lot of different cultures and communities, right? There's a French influence. There's a Spanish influence. There, a, the, there's an, a huge Italian influence. People don't realize that Italians also were a part of the making of New Orleans, also Haitians and Caribbean like folks. So it is a weird place. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was very exciting to dive headfirst into that strange oddity mm-hmm. that is New Orleans. Do you think that ha- growing up a- with a connection to a-, a diverse place like New Orleans was uh, one of the reasons that you that that led to your creation of We Need Diverse Books? Well, so We Need Diverse Books launched in 2014 with one of my fabulous friends who is CEO and president, Ellen O. It was a rallying cry for the industry to sort of step up and recognize that there are a lot of readers that are not being serviced. There are a lot of children that don't get to see themselves reflected on the pages of books and that it is unfair, that all children deserve mirrors, but they also deserve windows into other people's experiences because reading really breeds empathy Mm -hmm. um, and connection and it's part of how we become great global citizens. So um, I think growing up, I grew up in uh, Maryland uh, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. I think growing up, and that is a very diverse place with lots of different people. You've got the government, you've got embassies. So I grew up around a lot of people. And I think that went into my desire to make sure that every kid should be able to walk into their classroom library, their public library, their local bookshop, and see themselves reflected um, back so that they can have a relationship with literature Mm -hmm. um, and that they can help parents help their kids fall in love with books because kids read more than any other age group because they have to, they're Mm -hmm. forced to in school. And how can we make that more enjoyable if we create books that really get them excited Mm -hmm. um, to stay up late with a flashlight, Mm -hmm. to be yakking on the way to school, like, oh my God, let me tell you what happened in my book, mom. Mm-hmm. You know, like I can't sleep because I've got to read another chapter, dad. You know, like we want to create that kind of frenzy mm-hmm. for this kind of thing. It's great for their imaginations. Yeah. So. One, one of the things I love what you just said, you know, uh, every kid deserves to have a book reflect themselves. But also we need books that are windows to allow kids like me who grew up reading books about other white kids and, you know, friends, other other white friends. It's really important for those kids to be able to see that kids from different cultures, different races, different parts of the world are kids, are human beings. They bleed, they cry, they laugh, and they can be good friends. Exactly. And a book is where you can meet people that you might never meet. Mm -hmm. You know, you were saying that a lot of Americans don't leave the United States. Well, a book is where you can leave Mm -hmm. the United States if you don't have the means to go and create connectivity. And I think it just makes us better people if we can read about each other and see each other as heroic, Mm -hmm. as worthy. Um, And I just think that. It also makes for better entertainment. Mm -hmm. The shows and movies that come out of properties, book properties even, that have diverse content do really well because they connect to a lot of people and they get everyone thinking and talking and, you know, about story. Um, So I think it's a good move. (laughs) So you you were mentioning that that, uh, We Need Diverse Books launched in 2014. How has the industry responded? Uh, are, are, are things better? Things are better. Yeah. They've stepped yeah. up. I really see a lot of publishers stepping up. And so We Need Diverse Books came up with lots of programs in order to help do the work that we were calling out, right? So we made initiatives with publishers, an internship program where we would fund interns to come and work in publishing houses to diversify publishing staff. We worked with up-and-coming writers. We have a grant to give out to up-and-coming writers who need that extra money to take off, to finish their novel, to get the new computer. I mean, one of our first Walter Award grant winners was Angie Thomas, so she could finish The Hate You Give, which was one of the biggest YA novels um, of its time. And so we are trying to get at this from many different angles. We 
we put out book talking kits um, and shelf talkers for booksellers to be able to quickly talk about diverse books and have the vocabulary and the language with which to converse about them. We also work with parents and teachers to make sure they have the lists, make sure they're able to engage with their young person and say, hey, are you reading this? I'm going to read it with you. Let's talk about it um, to make it easier. So there are no excuses, mm-hmm. right? Like we have provided the materials to help you service this next generation Um And it's just about whether or not you want to step up. And I really feel like it is getting better. I'm waiting to see what the new stats are going to be. Hopefully they come out this year, but COVID has really delayed, you know, processes, but I'm glad to see it. I think we're on an upward trajectory. And, and I love that you're really pushing the idea of parents reading with their kids because it's, it's such a vital thing, and it's so beneficial for, for families to be reading together, co-reading together, and then talking about the books and talking about the movies and the music that we're listening to, um, you know, especially when our kids get into middle school and high school. It's, you know, it's that key that can open up conversation, whereas a lot of, a lot of times kids would come home from school and say, how was your day? Eh, I, I'm, it's going on, yeah. nothing. I'm all right, you know. Let's talk about a book. Okay. I can do that, you know? It's something that, it's an activity you can engage with. When I was a librarian, I used to tell my, the parents of my students who were complaining about, oh, my kid's not doing the reading, um, even the little ones, because I was elementary and middle. I said, readers are created in the laps of other readers. So when you read to children, it creates this intimacy between you and the child and the story. Right. And so you create the reader. My parents created me a reader who turned into a writer because my mom and dad read to me every single night, even though I was annoying and had them read the same book over and over again. I've triggered my mother. If I bring up a book called A Weekend with Wendell by Kevin Hinkies, she loses it because I made her read that book over and over again. And that's what created me. And I think it's a if you're having trouble connecting with your kid, with your young person pick up something that they're interested in or find something tangentially and read something together and then watch the adaptation of it on TV and get into a spirited debate about which is better and like how they feel about the essential questions in the text. I think that it is the one thing that we can do um, as a way to connect with our young people yeah. is use books. Yeah. They're there yeah. to, for connection. It makes perfect sense when, when that, kid is sitting on your lap and they are feeling loved when they are seeing that the person that is most important in their life has put down everything else to spend time with them and the thing that's bringing them together is this book how can a kid not fall in love with books exactly and you can remember what it feels like to be read to it's Mm -hmm. a very soothing thing and even when i was a teacher of third and fourth graders i would read to them every day it was the cool down Mm -hmm. there's something fundamentally human and uh, about being read to and like it brings you back to a place of peace and I feel like parents can really use that as a way to continue to connect with their young people especially as they grow up and get a little bit grumpier and like you know more independent and having their own opinions read something that that has a lightning rod issue that has many different sides and and debate it with your young person and talk about it because that's how I think we as adults also continue to learn Mm -hmm. is to have deep, meaningful conversations with young people. Even though they don't have the life experience that we have, they do have value. They see the world in a different way Mm -hmm. um, than we do. And we need to be reminded of the child that we once were. And I think books and young people can do that for us. Keep us young. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about this. We we talk, you know, we talk a lot about how parents can help kids understand different things reading together. I also think the reverse is true. You know, my kids grew up, thankfully, in a much more diverse world than I grew up in, not only in, in, in terms of uh, racially, but ethnically and in terms of, of um, uh, you know, the acceptance of folks w- with different um, identities. And so it's a lot easier for a kid to kind of relate to a, certain characters in books and to help the parents kind of relate and, uh, and be more accepting. Oh, absolutely. I feel like books are a place where you can have starter conversations for yourself and for others. If you have a kid who is struggling with mental health, you can read a book about a character who's struggling with mental health and it can open up a sort of a a conversation, even with you understanding what's going on with your kid. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Um, thinking, oh, my kid is depressed. Reading a book about a depressed teenager might give you some insight into what your kid might be dealing with or thinking about and find ways to access them and to help and, and help talk to them. Also, kids, queer kids and que- um, kids that come from different religious backgrounds. Books can be places where you can work out feelings and work out big ideas and and questions. Mm-hmm. I think that books are places where questions can be asked safely and there may not be answers, but at least we can get the question out there and start thinking about it. Yeah. And parents reading books that their kids are reading, it also keeps you tethered to what is on their mind. Mm-hmm. So read along with your kid. Even if they don't know you're reading, mm-hmm. it's still awesome to mm-hmm. be sneaking around reading the book that they're reading so you can talk to them about it. Yeah. They're like, how do you know about that? And yeah. it's like, look, kid, I've got diverse yeah. interests. <laughs> I can read. <laughs> hey, it, it, I, I was told that your experience as a librarian uh, kind of led to you cr- uh, being the co-founder of Cake Creative. Uh, I'm really fascinated. What's Cake Creative all about? Sure. So I, yes, I was a librarian for many years, and I'm the owner and founder of Cake Creative, which is a story kitchen. It's an IP company, intellectual property, meaning that I give up-and-coming writers a piece of my own imagination. And I build a story for them that would be great for their voice. And I teach them how I plot books. I teach them about the publishing industry and I launch them. I really figured out when we need diverse books launched and when I was struggling to break in as a published author that education is key, is paramount to like diversifying the landscape of books. And that meant that I had to send the elevator back down. I had to help a lot of other people join the publishing field. And so I did that by, I have a lot of stories. I have a master's in children's literature. I've read the entire canon of children's books. I am a nerd. I know the unique holes that exist in the canon. Um, and I wanted to fill them. I wanted to make sure that we, in 15 years or 20 years, that no kid is left behind in terms of like seeing themselves reflected um, and that parents and teachers and educators have all the resources that they need to make sure that their students engage um, and have higher literacy rates. So cake is my baby and it is my way of trying to hasten the process of getting more diverse titles on the shelves. Wow. That's kind of like an incubator. We hear of the, the tech incubators where these minds come together and they're kind of mentored and they create this next social media thing or the next app. And you're doing this with authors. Yes. Story incubator is the perfect word for it. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of stories in me from my history of reading. um, And so I wanted to share them and find a way. That's neat. Uh, Do you already have some authors uh, on your on your team? I do. I have a ton. If you check out kickcreativekitchen.com, you can see all of my books. One of my big series is with uh, Rick Riordan Presents. Uh, Rick Riordan is responsible for a Percy Jackson series, and he is the best guy in the world. We call him Uncle Rick. One of my big series is called Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky, and it is about a kid who falls through. He punches into a tree, and it rips open a portal into another world, and he has to save that world and his own. And it's um, it's like a middle grade American gods, but like that's one of my big series. I have another series called Love Sugar Magic, which is about a little Mexican-American girl who finds out that her family's business, which is pastries in a bakery, is they're full of magic. And she starts messing around in the family cookbook and makes a mess um, out of it because she's not allowed to use magic. Um, so I have I have 50 books now, so quite wow. a few. And, um, and yeah, and some really exciting ones that are coming out um, this year. But well, yeah. Well, I, I'm slightly and i'm slightly embarrassed to tell you that i don't remember the name of the author and i'm only slightly embarrassed because we've just published our 1300 episode but i do know that we had the author of love sugar magic on the podcast yes her name is anna mariano yes Mm -hmm. yeah oh yes i actually i no, i remember anna very very well so sweet she's she's a very very uh amazing young woman and it was great to have her on and we want to have her back on um wow so cool what a small world small world right this is wonderful you know it's it's cool she's great and i you know, I hired her because she comes from small town Texas and she's Mexican American and she understands big loud family and how someone could get lost in the shuffle if you're the littlest one around. 
And, you know, Mexican pastries are delicious. So it just, infusing them with magic was really easy. Um, And I wanted to make sure that my, I had a little girl, Mexican-American girl who used to harass me in my library about, can I have a book about witches? And so this was for her. Awesome. Well, I know that that Danielle is very, very busy today celebrating Shattered Magic. Uh, Before we let you go, Danielle, uh, first off, where can we go to find out more about Shattered Midnight, Shattered Midnight? Sure. You can find me online. I lurk on Twitter and Instagram at, at Brown Bookworm. And then also you can check out my website, DanielleClayton.com or CakeCreativeKitchen.com is my other website. Uh, but yes, you can find me online. I'm there and I'll be shouting about Shattered Midnight all week. Awesome. And I have a couple more events coming up. So appreciate it. Wonderful. We've had a fabulous time speaking to the author of Shattered Midnight. It's part of the Mirror series. Our guest has been Danielle Clayton. Danielle, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Barbara Newman. She'll be here to celebrate the dream catcher codes. That's the next episode of the podcast. Hey, if you're the author of a fantastic children's book, we would love to help you tell the world all about it. There's so many different ways that we can help you celebrate your great book. You can be a guest on the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Being a guest, it's fun. It's easy. It gives you the chance to tell the world in a long-form conversation all about your book, and it doesn't cost a thing. You can also submit your book to our certified great read program. If our panel believes that your book is worthy of four or five out of five stars, it becomes a certified great read. And with that status comes a number of really powerful tools that can help people know that your book is worthy of their consideration. Oh, and we have a fantastic monthly promotion program that will celebrate your book through commercials on the podcast, messages to our 75 thousand plus social media followers and display your book on our nationwide network of digital pedestrian billboards learn all about these opportunities by going to our website readingwithyourkids.com click on the authors click here button at the top of the page and scroll on down to the various services want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful Chris want to start by thanking our guest Danielle Clayton please be sure to check out Shattered Midnight we also want to thank our sponsor, Dr. Peter Salerno, Fit for Off-Duty, a great manual, great resource for firefighters and other first responders in our lives. I also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. 